five o'clock, we have a quorum. Um, so I will call the Smart Growth Steering Committee meeting to order and call out the attendees. Uh, we have Andrew Gnatic. Oh, actually, why don't I let you identify? Andrew Gnatic. Deborah Levinson. Mark Dunn. Justin Bellin. And we have from PDPC, we have Kyle. And who do we have on Zoom? Hey, Kayla. Just me, I think. Kayla Lubrio. Okay. Thank you. I think I've gone through the roll call attendance that they require these days. And uh, I can turn it over to you, Kyle. All right. Well, bear with me, everybody. I'm just trying to pull up some things. Okay. Um, my one drive is loading. But looking at our agenda today, um, I'd like to look at the draft land use survey report um, that we started to review last week or last session. Um, I've added some model bylaws. And um, so I'll go over a quick summary of those documents. Um, and then I have an appendix that I'll send out so everybody has those to reference. They're rather long individually. So um, I don't want to put everything into a big document that's really going um, um, And then after that, we will talk about public engagement. I have a little guiding document we'll talk through some work that I've done. And Are you able to hear Kyle? He speaks kind of softly. You can't? Okay. All right. Thank you, Kayla. Yeah. I'll make sure to project to the hour. I'd mm -hmm. actually appreciate a little bit. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so apologies. Let me just log into my own drives. While you're doing that, um, was it Hadley Media that opened up the doors so they could all? Uh, yeah. It must have been, okay. Because I brought the key, but I didn't get here till. Nick was the same, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because generally, with our five o'clock meeting, it, it will be locked up, but he opened it. Good. Next time, I hope they won't be coming from New Hampshire. I'll be able to <laughs> open it on time at like quarter of. So you have some appendices. We have not seen these, right? Right. No. Okay. <laughs> Can I ask a question while we're oh, please. waiting? So there's this Town of Hadley housing production plan from a few years ago. Is this something that we are following? Is this, is this a roadmap of some sort that whatever we do falls under? Or what, what does this mean for us? Uh, well, you can. I was going to say, I, I think it's one more resource, one more piece of information. We have a master plan, we have a master plan update, we have a housing plan. It just, it's another piece of the puzzle that tells us where we're strong or weak. That? Yeah, I think I think the state mandates housing production plans be produced for each town um, as a way of showing how you're going to accommodate whatever growth patterns you expect and providing the affordable housing associated with it to meet your minimum percentage. Are, are we, I mean, is it, it, is it authoritative in any way? I mean, can we point to it and say, look, in the housing production more, plan, yeah, it said right. this and this. Yeah, it's, it's prescriptive uh, more than authoritative. Um, by passing and adopting the document at the town level. So the planning board and the select board have both approved that document. And after approving that, they've sent it off to the executive office of housing local communities. They certify that plan, uh, which doesn't have to happen for Hadley because you've passed the 10% affordable housing threshold. Um, so one of the uses for the housing production plan is for those communities who haven't hit that milestone. Okay. They're um, the they are no longer uh, susceptible to a comprehensive permit that would bypass the planning board, go to the ZBA for an affordable housing. This exempts develop. them from. So for those that? communities under the threshold, it retains a, a permit granting authority in oh. the planning board. 
Oh. So, um, so within that document, there should be um, a few data sets that are helpful. So the housing need assessment is typically, you know, a bulk of the document, and that helps paint the picture of what housing is available, what housing is not, and the constraints that residents face. And then there's a strategy of how to increase production. Um, there should be annual goals um, for communities that are above the 10%. There's a lot more flexibility in terms of setting those goals. Yep. Okay. Uh, and you don't have to show the same amount of progress because you've you pass the mark. Um, there's important to have on file though, because the, the subsidized housing inventory with many of those units only um, restricted to affordable pricing for 30 years, you know, that, mm -hmm. that index is rolling, you know, the, those um, restrictions age out. So it's always important to have a housing production plan. I see. In case from year to year, you know, if one year all of a sudden 20 units are no longer on the inventory, they don't then right. we, we could right. fall on the right. Um, yeah. So it, it's it's good to have those on file, updated and approved and certified so that um, the community isn't susceptible, you know, all of a sudden next year. Um, so, you know, a, a comprehensive permit comes through. Sorry, it looks like it's still active behind that. Yeah, I'm just going to hide that. So, yeah. And then one other detail from it. Yes. It says that we are to assign someone to a regional planning group mm -hmm. related to housing. Does Hadley have such a person? Uh, I, believe, I believe it's the planning board chair who sits on the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission convenes a regional housing council. Well, does it is that Jim um, or Bill Dwyer Bill is Dwyer. our representative to the PD to the commission? Yeah, typically it's the PDPC town commissioner will sit on that. Um, we have a regional housing group, yeah, and it's either a commissioner from a community if the community doesn't have a professional planner mm -hmm. on staff. Mm -hmm. So typically it's a town planner or a member of the planning board or a commissioner. And he goes to meetings and reports it, back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm I'm his alternate. Right. So. And are those regional and, meetings of uh, value gone, to us? I've gone to Springfield, and they've those? they've been yeah. I mean, it's interesting to sit there uh, with people from all different towns and to hear what they're going through, and we all get guidance. And sometimes they have educational. I've been there when they had some trainings, so. And are they involved with the high speed train or that's something different? I don't believe that group is not that group, but you there's a valley development council, which um, is more like economic development broadly. Okay. Um, that's also a regional uh, group that PDPC convenes. Um, but the housing, the regional housing group, I think they need quarterly, if I'm not mistaken. Like uh, and oftentimes they'll invite a presenter, I think. And you would think they've had 40, I think they've had someone from the state come and speak about 40R in the past. And you represent what, like 40 some odd communities? 43, 43 in our region. And is there any sort of um, either encouragement or pressure or, you know, it, it, is there any sort of, um, I don't know, power, I guess, sure. behind that group to encourage individual communities to have a regional perspective. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, authority, it's um, there's not a lot of weight behind any um, action that the group can take. I don't believe there's any uh, enforceability. It's really just, a, it's more of an information sharing and coordinating committee. Um, it's also so, kind of it's also kind of a heads up, you know, this happened to our community, and then how do we handle that, or how do we be proactive? Yeah, yeah. And from that group, you know, PVPC has brought representatives from member communities together. So several years back, several years now, um, 
Pioneer Valley Planning Commission uh, made a model subdivision regulation. Um, and that was, I believe the housing committee identified representatives from the different towns that were interested. They came together, volunteered, and then provided uh, the feedback to kind of build this model regulation for communities. Um, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it's, just, it's one of the efforts that um, the regional planning agency, <clears throat> PDPC, uh, it's one of our strategies to stay regional in our thinking is to try to convene as many of these regional bodies as possible. Um, there is a regional housing plan. It's fairly out of date at this point. It's going on 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So there's not a whole lot of guidance or not a lot of relevance for that document. There's still some guidance. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of um, progress to be made. Um, but we all that group also references uh, work from the Donahue Institute because they've done a lot of regional housing reports as of late in the last two or three years. They've released a lot of good data. Uh, so uh, it's really kind of the forum to just keep the conversation going. Great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. Did you flash up an agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. I for did not. Today, I'm just oh. thinking of anyone that views this tomorrow or down the road. Um, I or if they're trying to find a particular meeting. Here we go. If yes. they see the agenda at the beginning, they might say, oh, that's not the one I'm looking for. Let me just share a different slide. Yes, so uh, today's agenda, <clears throat> uh, we'll get into a little bit of an update on the land use survey report, item number two. Uh, that'll be quick. And then we will jump into uh, a discussion on public engagement strategies. Uh, and then we'll set a time for the next meeting. Okay. So the meat of it is what we started to touch on at the end of the last meeting, is the public engagement. Okay, uh, so broadly, we last time we were here, we talked uh, quickly just uh, land use patterns um, in the process of updating the data here. Um, I created some confusion for myself, so I haven't verified everything, so I haven't finalized these data, uh, these numbers, um, in terms of total parcels. Um, I'll be conferring with my GIS specialist to get those numbers accurate and make sure I'm not making a headache for myself. But broadly speaking, you know, um, something close to 60% of land use is residential, single family, um, the vast majority of single family. Uh, you can see that in the breakdown of residential uh, zones, including agricultural residential, which is the largest. Are those percentages number of parcels or by acreage? That's by acreage, percentage by acreage. Yeah. Um, a uh, quick little summary of the base zone, six base zones. Um, summarize there. And then a quick summary of the overlay districts. Um, added some in, uh, quick summary of senior housing, uh, which is the same delineation as village center. It's the same zone, um, kind of set over one another. Um, and then adding the farmland preservation and receiving districts. So your pro your, that uh, relates to your agricultural residential zones are the farmland preservation part of that overlay. The receiving districts are the industrial and the business zones. So I didn't put that in there, clarify that. 
Um, and then you have a municipal zone, which is really just, uh, I think, two parcels um, off North Branch Road. I believe that's where the, is that the transfer station or I think it is called North Branch, which is yeah. It's like right on the water. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, um, have you defined, have you explained what receiving district means? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I can get into that. <laughs> I, I will happily add that to this document because, uh, I think it is worth exploring and uh, making sure everyone's aware. So the receiving district that refers to the concept of, um, transfer of development rights. So, um, upon the sale of parcels in the farmland preservation. Um, in that transaction, there can be uh, um, a, tr a transfer of the right to develop, right? So it, it allows for added density by, by limiting development in the agricultural residential, the farmland preservation by putting that um, restricting development, further development of those parcels. There can be a transfer of development right, which adds density in the business or the industrial zones. I have never witnessed this happen, so I personally am still a little foggy on how it breaks down as a process um, and what those covenants look like. But in essence, the, the principle is um, preserve as much of the farmland, historic farmland and agricultural soils as possible by restricting future development on those parcels and encourage uh, more dense development in um, industrial business zones, which are um, on the west side of town on the Route nine corridor. Um, that's the short of it. Yeah. So I didn't get into the density part of this because um, because of some mapping issues, but I will add that um, I really want to focus a little bit on just a summary of these three model bylaws. So. <clears throat> Eventually, this body, this group, will be asked to make a recommendation to the planning board for zoning amendments of some kind. Um, that can that could look a few different ways. It could be some strategic amendments to existing zoning language. It could be a new zone definition. It could be a new overlay district. Um, We have some model bylaws that I wanted to offer that are all overlay districts and their structuring, but they touch on a few different concepts that could either um, be adopted for Hadley or language could be extracted to offer some just general zoning amendments. Uh, the first up is a mixed use development bylaw that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission um, generated. Uh, this and the second PVPC bylaw that comes from our sustainability toolkit. So that also, those also are getting close to 10 years old. Um, but the mixed use bylaw really is um, trying to promote mixed use development where appropriate. Um, trying to facilitate integration of diverse uses, reducing vehicular traffic, promoting pedestrian friendly environments, um, which is all kind of within sustainable development or smart growth. Uh, and generally that's broken into about eight parts, standard scope and purpose, uh, establishment and administration, uh, definitions, Detailing the use regulations, uh, new dimensional requirements, performance standards, um, which may be, uh, I think, of import 
as we think about mixed use and putting residential right next to commercial um, or even a more intense use like an industrial use. Uh, your performance standards can help clarify access and traffic, noise, emission, odor, lighting, uh, and all the sort of nuisances that may come about from just a variety of uses. Um, parking and loading, I think, is also a topic that this group is going to hear about a lot, uh, particularly as we talk about more dense development and walkability in the sort. We skipped over special oh. permit, which I think is an important one. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, detailing special permit criteria, the bylaw details requirements and additional criteria. The, the bylaw, again, has some model language, so you, you can start thinking about um, what might be important to include um, for mixed use development. Um, it really just outlines that process. So the second um, model that I'm providing in the appendix is the infill development. <clears throat> um, this one is more focused on promoting redevelopment, utilizing underutilized or underused land, um, or trying to provide guidance on how to repurpose currently developed property. Um, this is more typically focused on large or excuse me, smaller parcels, you know, the type that wouldn't meet um, your base zoning of any um, type. Um, so this might not be the most relevant, but I think, again, it would be worth the steering committees having access, review it, thinking about uh, any of the uh, uh, additional standards, landscaping, parking, um, I think the commonly held lot topic may be of interest and you may want to look at that a little bit more. Uh, what was the I, last one you said? Oh. Um, commonly held lots, number seven. So allowing for treatment of adjacent lots as a single entity. So I maybe identifying where those really small parcels um, that are adjacent to one another or adjacent to a larger parcel might be uh, worth considering a single entity. Is that like in, in lieu of a lot consolidation application or something like that? I would think so. I need to, again, this one isn't very common in the in the valley. So I need to get uh, a little better informed on it. Yeah, if we could roll back, I was just going to ask you, and you may not have, do you, can you think of any examples where the infill has been applied. I mean, is that something literally where you're building in side yard setbacks? I mean, I think of a more urbanized downtown, you know, they have a vacant lot or something right. like that. Or is it just, it's a buildable lot that just hasn't been built or something? Or that's up to our special permit parameters if we want to get that dense and right. Eliminate some side yards in some overlay. Right. Um, in application, if that's an application, I believe Holyoke has adopted an infill bylaw. Um, even that is not meeting their needs always um, because of um, minimum uh, footprints for housing. But the idea is that most typically this is applied to um, already built out kind of urbanized zone or downtown area. So this one may be the least applicable, okay. but I think it's worth considering this review. It might apply, for example, to the Railroad Avenue mm -hmm. area, yeah. might it? Possibly, I'm not familiar with Railroad Avenue. Railroad Street, that's still one really district. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 Well, in that, in that case, it might even be a simpler mechanism to just amend that zoning overlay rather than introducing a third overlay, right? Because we've got 
village and senior overlays. Yeah, they're on top of each other. Yeah. And uh, a personal anecdote, professional at least, uh, having a conversation with um, a developer in Hadley that was curious about senior village overlay, reviewing that bylaw with the developer and talking about um, just the realities of financing affordable or senior development. Uh, the way that bylaw is written currently is, I think it, it, there's a very strict limit of how many units are in an individual building. Um, and it's at this point not economical for a developer to produce, to build within those constraints. It's just, so I think that that be, might be a general recommendation to come out of this topic. I'm sure there, there will be a, many recommendations, but something to consider when, as we look into, you know, reviewing various overlays, something to think about. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the final model bylaw provided to, uh, in the appendix is the 40R smart growth zoning overlay. So this comes directly from Executive Office Housing Livable Communities um, and would be the document if 40R is the route the committee and then the planning board want to pursue. Um, this is the document that EOHLC references when they look at whatever is provided for approval. Um, and part of the application process is to include um, a red line version of this document. So they like to see you pretty much build your bylaw off of their model. Uh, the more closely your, not your, the more closely the proposed bylaw is to the model, the faster their review and approval. That's they they say it that. Open it. So. Uh, so this one is again it kind of breaks it into two sections: general regulations that would apply throughout the zoning, um, and then an option for more specific uh, regulations that you would want to include, like your map and actually delineating your zone, um, overlay district. Um, there's a requirement to specify that residential development is allowed as of right, and then uh, detailing what mixed use development uh, is permitted. Uh, you have the opportunity to set dimensional uses, parking, parking but parking and other development standards. Um, and then they're, they encourage you to pull out parking requirements specifically. The goal is to encourage less parking to maximize uh, pedestrian friendly design and how similar and <clears throat> similar or different is that overlay from our village center overlay um be fairly significant um i'd have to look back at the village center i looked at it in a week or two um but I mean, there's there are elements that are similar, uh, design standards, um, and um, some per some mixed use development permitted. Um, but the dimensional requirements, that's where a, a smart growth district is going to allow a bigger range, a wider range of building sizes, um, more density. Um, okay. One element, so outside of the regulatory differences, the 40R district is the only option on this table that comes with state level financial um, incentives. Yeah. True. Yeah. True. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, and just to speak to, uh, Deb asked a wonderful question after our first meeting uh, regarding the amount of affordable units developed in 40R districts in our Pioneer Valley communities. And there are seven that have a 40R district. Um, um, I think Deb just noted that the affordable uh, units as a percentage of total built is 
currently pretty high. It's well beyond the 20%. Um, and I think that data set just spoke to what was built, not versus not what was projected to be built. So what um, I think is happening is that um, municipalities that have gone the 40R route um, try to make the zone and the density requirement you know, allow for as many units as possible, recognizing that at least 20% have to be affordable um, across the whole district. And then they're allowing the affordable units to go on first, go online first. And they're really working with developers to get those units built and not focus so much on the market rate. Huh. Um, and that 20% that requirement also is for projects greater than 12 units. So there's also communities who have seen uh, 40R development happening, but projects that are fewer than 12 units, so they don't have to require the 20% um, minimum. So unfortunately, that's kind of a... Uh, um, you're building less than 12 units. You're yeah, if you're building less than 12, to... it's it's a way that a developer they could skirt potentially it. skirt around that affordability requirement. So just something okay. to think of. Question, Ryan, but something you just said. Mm -hmm. um, or at least the way I heard it, it sounded like the communities that have, that some of the communities that have done 40R have, <clears throat> I got the impression had, somehow coerced the developers to build the affordable first. Is that something you can write into your your bylaw? Isn't that more an economic hardship that they want to, you know, or is, is that something that we can control? Which units they build? I don't know if in the bylaw it can be written that way. I'd have to explore more with the communities. Um, I mean, that'd be great. Could yeah. Give us the affordable ones first and then. Go I, I know that. Um, I know that similar to like the inclusionary zoning bylaw section of the zoning um, at certain for those larger projects at certain benchmarks. So, you know, 50 percent total build out. X amount has to already be affordable. I know that that correlates so if if it's a hundred units to be built we know that 20 percent have to be uh, affordable at 50 percent of completion the requirement might be that you know 70 percent of the affordable units are already online um, so that also could be where our data is leading us is that you know there are bigger projects that are at certain stages the affordable units are online, the market rate is not yet. I think another thought that just came from your question, Marcus, there are some jurisdictions like Phoenix, Arizona comes to mind uh, where their zoning has uh, what they call a bonus matrix and it's specific to sustainability, but basically if the developer elects to do one of the options in the bonus matrix, like collect rainwater, add solar, you know, whatever it might be, they get a development incentive, like higher density, additional height. Um, so there could be a mechanism written into the zoning that would, incentive. for you know, if you want to say at 5% affordable, you get the base code. If at 20% yeah. affordable, you get higher incentives. And yeah. maybe we could mm. uh, incentivize the affordable development first that way. Right, yeah. That's a great point. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so there's a separate document, appendices, um, where you'll have the zoning map available, the mixed use development model bylaw from PDPC, the infill development model bylaw, and then from the Commonwealth, the 40R model. Um, it got pretty long. I think it ends up being close to 50 pages, um, less than less than 50, but it, it, it gets long. So, um, any general questions about that right now? Or should I mean, really continue the engagement? You're going to share that with us when it's no longer a draft or while it's a draft? Yeah, the appendices will, I'll send right along. Okay. Um, 
and then I'll try to get this unfinalized uh, as soon as possible. Um, I'm actually going to need our GIS specialist tomorrow, so I'll be able to clarify my mistakes that I'm having on my my end. Um, so. Um, Yes, 57 pages, so I apologize. It does get, it did get pretty long. Um, it's almost like something was complicated. It's <laughs> almost like it's, it is rather complicated. So on to engagement. On to engagement. So this is more uh, of kind of just a starting point for conversation. Um, I've got a few ideas and a few thoughts or examples that I can pull up um, as we discuss these strategies. But this is what we've talked about. Um, I started building this based on our conversation last time. Uh, and thank you, Andrew, for sharing the housing production plan survey. I think that's a good reference and or starting point for um, any follow-up questions that you may want to explore. Um, uh, and also thank you, Justin, for uh, sharing today what the Housing and Economic Development Committee has been thinking about. Uh, and we'll get into that when it comes to larger community meetings. So, um, uh, <laughs> uh, so coming out of last meeting, I think um, the steering committee seemed to agree that a multifaceted approach is preferred, especially with the time of year that we're in and the amount of projects that are happening across the community. So uh, for the summer months, I think for July, August, and maybe into September, maybe right towards Labor Day, uh, having an online survey would be the first wave of engagement. Uh, this would want, we'd want I heard from our last meeting that this would be more of a brief, general kind of survey. Um, uh, we could build this focus uh, by, you know, follow-ups to the housing production plan. If there were from that survey, if there were particular responses that we thought would um, um, Uh, you know, additional thoughts would or elaboration would be welcome. Um, there's also general topics to explore with folks, um, including uh, parking requirements, uh, density or intensity of use broadly, um, identifying you know um, the multimodal, the transportation elements that. We would want to consider such as sidewalks, bike paths, um, street parking versus um, off street parking, that sort. Uh, we can also think about open space, green space within a district um, that could uh, look like landscaping requirements within the de design standards, um, or even you know um, a percentage of a parcel a certain amount of the parcel being dedicated to open space. Um, and pickleball. Or pickleball, yeah, yeah. Open space can be active or passive, don't, don't forget. Um, so a couple of questions that just quickly, these are just examples and happy to, if there are questions that are coming to mind that we want to know. Um, First up, just what is the highest level of intensity that would seem fitting in a mixed use district along Route 9? Um, there are kind of ranges of intensity of use uh, when it comes to planning and zoning. Um, mixed use as a category is pretty intense. That's more at the high end of, of that 
range, uh, but we could show visually some examples of what a um, medium degree of intensity would look like. That tends to be your duplexes, your row houses. Uh, you know, it's, it's mostly residential, but it's far more dense than your single family neighborhoods. <clears throat> Uh, and then there's an in between that's you know your your like three or the uh, triplex your three story flats your larger um, like eight unit large manor houses that are you know they may look like a more traditional New England home but there's actually far more units than meets the eye. Um, so that would be that a type of question that we could explore. You know, get a sense from residents, what are they comfortable with as they think about mixed use around the corridor? Um, I'm, I'm, so I'm just having an aha moment yeah. because I'm just realizing I'm coming at this from an architect's perspective, right? And I'm seeing, I'm hearing mixed use. So I'm thinking like a mixed use like in, in the buildings, like you're going to have residential above commercial, but you're saying the district is mixed use. So you're putting duplexes or triplexes in between yeah. potentially commercial. Yeah. I'm thinking one building. No, but it's that that's an option. Right. But it could also be just purely residential in an overlay that doesn't currently have right. residential. Exactly. Just sharing that with anyone else that's as dumb as I am. Oh, no, oh, no, no it, see, I think I think that's exactly yeah. the kind of thing that I, I need to hear yeah, because yeah. I think all of you here have more technical knowledge and experience than I have in this particular area. But I think they do. <laughs> well, you're on the planning. You well, know, yeah, planning board, yeah. You're an architect. But I think they're on. more planner planners and builders. Yeah, right. But you, you share yeah. the language, yeah. and I, I know I'm asking some questions that are obvious to the rest of you, but I I feel like that's important because most of the people who are going to answer this survey mm -hmm. don't have the technical background. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if there's questions about mixed use, it would take some space, I think, to explain what that means and what the, you know, what... How these questions fit in with it, and yeah, it could, and it may be too tech. I don't know. It may be too technical, or it may be possible to break it down into right. steps so that it does. Yeah, well, yeah, I think too. If you, Deb and I were talking okay. earlier about the survey results uh, from the housing production plan, and if you read the text input, mm -hmm. um, it was very clear to me that I mean, ignoring the opinions in those uh, right. text responses, it was clear to me that a lot of people didn't understand the question. Mm -hmm. Or the question was structured in a way that was so complicated that it right. was hard for them to like rate, you know, the whether you're in favor of or against housing in these 17 areas. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think to the extent that we can keep the online survey questions simple to right. yes or no, you know, would you be in favor of infill on previously developed underutilized sites on Route 9? You know, like if we can keep it to something that is objective, that does, you know, intensity is a negative word. So somebody's going to look at that and say, I don't want any intensity. At least quiet and rural. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's I think right. we need we really need to cater to language. right yeah. cater to the audience. Yeah, oh, I think that's right. I mean, I remember filling out that survey. I thought it was really interesting. It was good in a lot of ways, and it was hard to fill out. And I got I got fed up with it at a certain. I mean, I, I did it, but I got frustrated because it was it was saying, "Do you think there's enough condos in town?" I don't even know how many condos there are in town. Yeah. And that's what some of the comments right. back were. Right. You know, are there enough of this? Are there enough of that? I don't know. What's the need? I mean, there was yeah. a lot of assumption behind it that Right. Like, like I'm making up this number from your statistic earlier, but if 83% of the land in Hadley is under the agricultural residential, maybe the question is. 83% of Hadley's land is not currently proposed to be developed. Exactly. Would you be in favor of the remaining 20% being developed? Exactly. Like those kinds of questions put it in a, in a lens that people can understand and, and articulate, and then maybe their answers will be a little bit more direct. Yeah. If uh, time and money were no object, with an online, you could have hot links. 
that would go to a little explanation or a little cartoon sure. of, of options. Yeah. That might be the second engagement if we get into more detail. In focus groups. Yeah. yeah. Or I, I mean, there's a second engagement back in the fall, right? Uh, well, our our larger community meeting. The larger, yeah. yeah, yeah, the third strategy. So, um, <clears throat> what I'm hearing, just in regards to survey, online survey, this is our first wave of engagement. Keep it simple, primarily removing jargon, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to really, really define. We are explaining it, right? Clearly, yeah. As long as you're uh, at least explaining, uh, possibly. Um, or yes, no type questions, or very specific select, you know, uh, from a, a handful of options. Uh, building it on SurveyMonkey, we should have the capacity to insert some images, so that allow for you know some. If we talk about the example of you know intensity or density, we can have some correlating pictures so that folks get a sense of what they're selecting, what they're voting on. Um, any other thoughts? I think I know we're talking specifically about you know, development and housing, but we may also want to gauge um, public sentiment about some of our resources, like the bike path. Uh, it's outside of the area we're currently talking about, but you know the river walk or um, the conservation land over by the river. I don't remember what it's called. Uh, it's sterile. So uh, yeah, the Dawson. Dawson. Yeah. Those are because uh, you know, I think that's that is uh, the bike path, especially for the area we're talking about. But those yeah. gauging those kinds of like, how do you feel about the spaces we currently have, mm. could then inform how we zone and plan for more spaces like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great point. Uh, bike path, river walk, and is Dawson separate from uh, Dawson? Is the I call it the river walk. Okay. Dawson is the the name of it, and there's Silvio Conti. Um, um, is that uh, sanctuary or yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mount Warner. I don't know if that's really like a true recreational area. Yeah. I've been up there. Sounds like a Mount Warner. Warner. Is that a state park or something? It's yeah. Trustees of Preservation, I think. I think it's yeah. yeah. one Okay. So you get, gauge a sentiment of maybe the amenities or resources that mm -hmm. we would want to connect. To a district, or oh, you know, consider a lot. Right. Think about designating this. You know, what are those amenities that might be of um, value to residents? Right. Yeah, I think that's good. I think having at least one open-ended yeah, yeah. question is good, and mostly the short one, you know, the simpler ones. But I thought reading through those comments on the. Um, 2022 survey, it was really worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't I haven't retained all of it, but <laughs> I, I got through as much as I could. I've read a few of these surveys and the responses, and it all just starts to become a, a big old mess. But uh similar, similar themes and takeaways, and yeah, I think it's it's noticeable in the responses to the written comments that there's a degree of confusion just in how the questions are framed yeah. and built. I wonder if it's good, and I don't know if this is just an issue for the survey or in general for our public work. There seem to be issues that come up that where, that are very specific, that people feel very strongly about, and that probably we aren't going to exactly address through this committee. Things like the lack of maintenance at Golden Court, for example. Right. Just stuff that always comes up you know, people being pissed off at student rentals, in, right. you know, in, in residential areas. Um, I jotted down, there's like three or four of them that just always come up and they're important and they do need to be addressed, but probably we're not going to address them, but sort of just to acknowledge it, like we get that, the, so that, yeah. you know, sort of pre-hear that so that people or feel maybe more like they can address what we're talking right. about. Right. Yeah. I wonder if there's a way to make those also like objective questions where you could say, you know, are you happy with uh, the condition of Hadley's affordable housing stock? 
or are you happy with the development along Route 9 over the past 10 years? It, it, it doesn't have to be open-ended necessarily because they'll get at the same, the same basic thing. Like, there's a clear sentiment in town about certain issues, so it makes sense to find out what the temperature is on those issues. Right. Well, right. well there's some like that that are, I think are more general, and there's some we just know there's at least a portion of the respondents yes. That's why they're going to answer the survey is to try to be heard on those on those hot button the hot button issues gotcha. third rail kind of yeah exactly yeah. and if we just say hey we know those and yeah. it's true yeah. and maybe there's like a text enter question where it's you know what would you like to see of Route Nine or you know what would you like to see of have these housing stock in the future you something that they could then type in their comments but definitely not all the questions because that. Yeah, because like definitely we kind of know the answer for like the housing inventory, affordable housing inventory and development on Route 9. Like, so like having some kind of like text where you can further elaborate on that mm -hmm. is probably pretty beneficial to us. I'm going to move on just for the sake of time and make sure that we discuss all of our strategies so far. Um, I do have quite a bit of notes on our survey, so I'll draft up those first handful of questions. Get that started. Um, second prong of our uh, approach, our strategies, uh, conducting focus groups. So scheduling a series of focus meetings with specific stakeholders um, allows you opportunity to talk with you know, community members directly. Um, so it would typically fall on the steering committee to help identify those stakeholders or those sessions uh, and then encourage secure participants. Um, and then of course you'd be welcome to attend and just kind of help facilitate the conversation. Typically those come with We'll come up with you know kind of six guiding questions or so, a handful of guiding questions, and then it's just a chance to get as many you know, people talking at once uh, about the issue. Um, I, quick thought on some groups to consider. Um, there's a Hadley Business Council. I don't know exactly how to get in touch with that group. It was referenced in a Business West article I read about Route Nine. Um, Molly. Molly Keegan? Molly, Molly, Molly might, might be on it. it. I think yeah. she, I know yeah. Lynn Gray, the, the pyramid group is on it. She, okay. She's mentioned that, but Molly may know. Yeah. yeah. It was in the article. I couldn't I couldn't remember if she mentioned it or if it was just alluded to, but yeah. So um I think that would be worthwhile, especially if they've already participated in some conversations about the same topic. Uh of course, I think it's valuable always to talk to um our elders in the community, so the council on aging. Uh, particularly as we look at some of the feedback on residents that are open to aging in place or, or at least want to stay in Hadley, if not in the same uh, residence, you know, they want to stay in, in town. It's important to talk to. Uh, I yeah. think it may also be of, of worth to discuss you know, with uh, department heads, the town administrator and select board, bring them together for a, a focus group just to uh, get a sense of what they're seeing, the, the realities of their work, and how mixed use may uh, play into that. Are there any agricultural groups in town? No, is there an organization? I would I probably know. ask Denise Barstow yes, if she knows. Well, there's CISA, but I don't know that that's Hadley specific. Yeah, okay. There's an agricultural commission. I'm not sure how often they meet, though. But there is a board. That would be probably pretty good to have. Yeah. Yeah, I think that may, yeah, I think you're right, Andrew, especially as we think about, we don't want to draw or we don't want to consider a district that would be encroaching in any way. That no, they might be without that. that community. I mean, they're like the Hadley ancestors. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. I, would, I would also, I don't know how, but I would like to find a way to get the flip side of that cohort, which is the young people who don't own homes, mm -hmm. you know, whether they're renters or children living with parents. There's a, there's actually quite a few people in town who are not engaged in town governance in any way because they're not homeowners and don't get the water bill. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
identifying renters. those folks will be the that's yeah i don't have the answer to that question but um it, yeah well the two key groups that have been mentioned you know in the master plan and on forward are senior you know who have been focused on a lot are the seniors and workforce folks right. working age people who can't afford right you know standard homes anymore in hadley and you know this is like a catch-22 like well how do we how do we find those people how do we capture they're, them how do we capture because they're not involved in the town well they're not involved in the town because they're never asked to, you know we don't have a way to yeah. or they're engage. working two jobs and they don't have time to of course yeah, yeah. of yeah. course yes do we have the ability to just send mailers out to every address on record in town where we could say are you between the ages of 18 and 30 or you know, like is there a way that we could try to get their attention somehow Does our grant have any budget leeway there that's interesting i would have to look okay i okay. to see but yeah i was thinking that. mailers are are fairly effective but it, yeah there's a cost you know we might get to, you know, I don't know what the rate is on post, you know, if you can right. get it to a postcard, you're going to make it, you know, the most for your, your dollar. But right. I wonder if we could double up and maybe the online survey could be on a mailer that also advertises focus group applications or whatever. Awesome. What a good idea. Yeah, I think we could be looking at it. Um, um, and how do we get the list for the online? Is like every voter have to register an email address or? Or is that protected and we can't get that? Does it have to be an opt-in? Uh, was it the Council on Aging that sent the, or no, it was the Housing Production Plan Survey. So someone sent a mailer out and I think it had a QR code or at least a website written on it. And that's how I found it. Yeah. Uh, typically with online surveys, because there is the potential for a non-resident to yeah. enter into, typically I like to build up those surveys with that first question, are you a resident of Hadley? And if they are honest and they hit no, if they automatically get kicked out and they can't come back in. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, just thank you for your interest, but this is available only for residents. Of course, if they're dishonest from the get-go, then you know, you're just kind of accepting that you may have some slightly skewed data, but what that is slightly skewed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if SurveyMonkey has the opportunity to do it, but some of them will be able to log IP addresses, you make can, sure you can't yeah. have duplicate response rates. I mean, we, we, we've done it that way. Um, oftentimes, though, we found that with, particularly with communities where we're trying to engage the senior population or those that are less um, um, tech savvy. Tech savvy, thank you. Um, or tech we, comfortable. We, allow multiple entries by IP address because oftentimes we'll have physical copies. They'll come to us and one of us at the agency will just be putting in, you know, 20 hard copies just to get with that. Right. You're saying so it would be available hard copy too? We can, yeah, we can definitely do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, so the focus groups, I think, um, We've got a couple of added ad commission rich with young families. Is there an active like parent teacher organization? I think there's a good PTA. Yeah. Yeah. That that might be a starting point for yeah. at least for families, for yeah. you know, school age families. Yeah. Um, I wanted to suggest if we could ask um the Hadley Learns group to put it. If they'd be a good group, if you're familiar with them or not. I, it, it would be a resource. I'm just afraid it could irritate some people because they'd say, oh, you went to a left-leaning group. You didn't go to the right-leaning group as well. You know, I, That just could put us in a negative light. But if there is a, you know, and maybe I'm just assuming that it's more progressives that are on that just because I know a few are doesn't mean that everyone is. I think it leans progressive. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons I mentioned it though is that they had done education around the housing issue mm. a couple years ago. They kind of focused on that and had several sessions on it. So, you know, it's a group that's taking time and interest. Yeah. Yeah. It. 
Okay. Um, I don't know. I wonder if they might have some ideas. Anybody else? I mean, the left leaning, right leaning thing. I think we can make the questions as as uh, unbiased as possible. But I would guess I don't know, have this on any authority that the um, agricultural commission or whatever is probably very conservative minded. And I mean, in any town, you're going to get a cross section of. Yeah different opinions and types. I don't think there's any harm in getting the voices at least to contribute to the discussion. As long as they're citizen dependent. Okay, so we've got a pretty good list growing of focus groups. So um, a few of those are kind of defined groups and a couple maybe more open-ended to try to identify participants. Um, Typically, those you don't really want more than eight voices, right? You want to be able to get everybody a chance to contribute, um, but those can usually an hour and a half conversation. Our la the last strategy would just, be just one more thought yeah, on that. And I don't know if anyone in this room knows, but I'm just wondering if the timing worked right. If we could get that postcard type survey if we could, would we be allowed to add that as an insert into like a town water bill now? Do you think the town would? I like that idea. I don't know. When well, I can't get the homeowners right. not managed, but. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's if we can do it, but to address, which I mean, you can export a list of addresses from GIS in 10 minutes. That's gonna get you more directly to the resident population mm -hmm. than the homeowners. Yeah. Although it's, it's probably a, that a large majority of the homeowners are the residents. But yeah. There's still that population of people that's really underrepresented at this point. Yeah. Okay. So is that that's a semi-annual bill, right? It's quarterly. It's quarterly. Okay. Yeah. I'll okay. check with. So when was the last one? Uh, I think they came in at the end, it comes at the end of the quarter, I think. So, so it should be coming up. March, I think, was the last one. Is it Susan? Actually, I have it. Is she the collector? I don't know. I think, I, I think we could check with her. <clears throat> I think that's a, that's a, and I can, I can oh, ask, uh, I can ask, um, the last one came in May. I can oh, ask, so yeah, that, that can line up. If the last one came in May, the next one comes in August. Thereabouts, we could, we could have that ready mm -hmm. as an insert. All right, I'll, I'll ask Carolyn Brennan if that's that's awesome. you know, if that's a no no or like, oh, yeah, sure, yeah, that's no be, yeah, because you're you're trying to reach the population and get their feedback. It just it seems like a great piggyback, yeah, right. You know, on these other, I, I know you want to move on, I'm sorry, but no, on good. these other small groups that are more. Like department heads, or you know, people who are already have a voice. Right. Let's say, I wonder if they could be contacted and and also encouraged if they know of, mm -hmm. you know, say other business owners who right. aren't on the council, but you know they feel have opinions about the town and would you know might like to participate. Right. You know, to lead that up. Like make it clear it's not we don't only want the people who <clears throat> right already have a platform yeah uh, absolutely right you want to try to include as many voices in the conversation uh, I think it's worthwhile if if you identify you know your your focus groups that you really want to have scheduled meetings for but there could be outliers you know people that just can't meet the meet that schedule or it's their vacation week or whatnot. Uh, having the questions available just as an additional kind of you're not available to meet with us but we'd love to have your input please take some time to respond to these questions and send it back you can at least bring it in uh, even if they're not available to sit first yeah. um, the last uh, the last uh, leg of engagement will be um one of, I believe I said PTA, uh, Hadley Mothers Club is probably the better place to go with. Hadley's Mothers Club? Hadley Mothers Club. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Sorry. Yeah, they're very, uh, Thank you. they have an annual um, 
pre-election meet the that's, candidates. Yeah, that's who hosted candidates night. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yes, that's not all we do. That's right. uh, do they have any programming like right before the school year starts? Typically, do you know? I confess I don't know. Just something to think about. That might be a good time if they're good luck programming or... something. You might be able to piggyback. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the last section while, while we're looking into that um, a public forum or a large community meeting. This would be kind of a open to the full residents, um, broader community. Um, be part educational, part conversational, or part um, you know, feedback. Um, I included two formats. Um, we could go like a panel, similar to what uh, Justin shared from the Housing and Economic Development Committee. Um, I just copied that, those bullets, just to kind of get it in there. To clarify, did you ever have the first session? Has this happened again? No. no. Uh, the funny part is we were desperately trying to get Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's attention to help facilitate it yeah. and uh, just couldn't get the schedules to work. And then this came up. And so now we're here. All right, cool. So <clears throat> if the steering committee likes this and the uh, Housing Economic Development Committee is still wanting to support this, this might be a good way to partner with another standing body uh, to get convene. I now have just kind of broad availability for this project so we can make it work. Uh, Ken Comia, I confirmed with him, he has a copy of this and so he knows about it. Um, so it's also could be available to support. Um, so this large meeting could look like a panel with a few short introductory informative uh, presentations that then lead into you know, a panel uh, discussing the topics, elaborating on issues, building questions. Um, or it could be more uh, of a conversation style, uh, which is similar to what we tried in um, in May in East Long Meadow, who was also looking at exploring 40R or mixed use smart growth you know, broadly. Um, that one started with a 10 minute kind of introduction where uh, we clarified the project for the community, talked about the master plan, talked about housing, and then kind of led into four rounds of conversation. So residents were with a facilitator from the steering committee that that community is formed. The steering committee member, one for each group, kind of had a list of questions, prompts, um, and just kind of talked through those for about 15 minutes, try to get as much input as they could. We do a quick little feedback, uh, report back, so that each, you know, there's a little bit of a break between each conversation, a little breath. Um, before going into the next one, there was a prompting uh, slide that we projected to kind of frame the topic and question. And then there were additional questions that the facilitators had to keep that conversation going with follow-ups. So there are a couple of topics where you can provide some follow-up questions. Um, fairly successful, it seemed. Um, we counted 80 plus participants at that event on Monday night. Um, and that was um, pretty pretty well attended. That's that's one of the better attendees. And how large were was each conversation group? So um, there ended up being eleven groups. So I think we tried to keep it about six seven residents. Um, so it's sort of like a group, like the small groups, but the but focus groups, but simultaneous, yeah, yeah concurrent, like a breakout groups. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. But, you know, the topics and the, the order of top of conversations was the same and those were happening, happening concurrently. Um, and then, you know, reporting back just a few of those each round, you could hear, you know, people's, oh yeah, or you know, new ideas that came from across the room that your group didn't get to. Uh, so it, I think it was pretty positively received. Uh, um, the conversational type meeting uh, brings to light a lot of misconception and confusion that residents have, but it also provides you the space 
um, to kind of work through those and help people get past um, whatever detail they're hung up on or confusion that they're holding on to. Um, so there is benefit to that. Uh, and also, it's interesting to hear residents talk, you know, to each other and share. Some, uh, it's surprising how quickly you may find some contradictions in, the, in logic, but um, yeah, people just kind of like way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we all have it, right? We, we all have those yeah. uh, those contradictions that we, for some reason, we hold on to. Uh, the way that we framed those conversations, uh, the example from East Long Meadow, we had four rounds. Talked about preserving green and open space. Spoke specifically about housing. Spoke specifically about economic growth, and then connecting community, where we talk more about historic cultural uh, resources in their proposed district. Um, so that's just an idea. Um, we don't necessarily have to get further along on this leg of the engagement uh, in the short term, but I think um, the more we can focus on uh, strategy one and two over the next few weeks, the better we'll be uh, prepared to kind of roll out late July, I think. Any thoughts on strategy three at the time? Yeah, I was envisioning having like three or four different rooms. And like I remember going to my stepson's um, like uh, accepted students thing, and there were like three or four topics, and you kind of groups just moved from one room to the next. What, you know, now that didn't have it like ours would end with bringing all that together and saying, here's what we saw from the group. Yeah. Yeah. That might be nice to get it. And some final feedback on, this is what we heard from groups A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. I'd offer the, uh, I think the education component is really important. And yes. uh, this, the Housing and Economic Development Committee's uh, outline was precipitated by the survey results from the housing production plan, specifically asking for more information and right. education on these subjects. And so if we're going to have people engaging in dialogue mm -hmm. about them, it would help to give them a little context. Absolutely. I'll throw this one out there just because I think it's the one myth that seems to perpetuate is that if we put in more housing, it means we have to build more schools. Yeah. And, you know, we, we met with the superintendent, the, committee, the housing committee met with the superintendent and found out that actually we are under capacity and right. we fill the rest of our capacity with school choice, which does give us some funding, but that if they were our own residents, we would get more funding. So it's a bit of a fallacy to say that the school system would be taxed by more residents. So I think like the education piece mm -hmm. can help to dispel some of those myths before those conversations would happen. Yeah. Uh, since you brought up Justin, just other than school age children and schools, I know that uh, myth busting, there's some perceptions on infrastructure, water and sewer, um, that um, I think not always what people think. Um, are there others that you all might foresee um, kind of sticking points that we may want to prepare some I have one one big one okay. um, because I wrote a whole op-ed on this and ended up not publishing it. But that we have a in what I call a tax fallacy in our town. You know, we we look at the commercial zone and think of that as the reason why our property taxes are yeah. low, and that is true. I think it's something like sixty something percent of our tax revenues from our commercial district. But what it doesn't highlight is that we don't receive any tax benefit from retail outside of the property value of that retail often, which is devalued intentionally in order to reduce tax burdens for businesses. But mixed use multifamily developments, the National Association of Realtors reported that mixed use developments generate upwards of 10 times as much tax revenue for a town than straight retail does. So I think to the extent that we can educate a little more on the financial side of running a town, that might help to dispel that myth that we can't build there because that's where businesses go. Right. Yeah, there is, that's, so that's bigger. Meals and 
hotels, you know. Yeah, right. So meals, hotels, and cannabis are the three that we do have a local options tax for. So we we do generate tax revenue per sale but on those. Chasey Penny or something like that. It's just the property value. Right. Which with the bank for, with the foreclosure announcement for the mall likely means the assessed value of that mall will drop. Uh, I mean, hypothetically, we don't know how it's going to pan out, but if the assessed value of the mall drops, so does our revenue. And these, these are the important things to understand about how our taxes are generated and how our properties, our property taxes stay low. I also, you know, it was just one person told me that they've been aware of other, numerous other locations where Pyramid Mall goes through this foreclosure and, and then it just, it's 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 a way to turn it around and revitalize it. So mm. yeah, I think there's a certain scare in town that this might be like it's going under. Right. But that it's because it's happened before. What I've heard is that's not always the case. That, you know, sometimes it's a some financial step that they take or one of their other corporations or whatever buys it. But yeah, I don't know. That a way to refinance their debt load or something. Yeah. Well, I think the education piece is very important, and I think the conversation piece is very important. Right. And I would love to see some mix of the two. I, I would not want to see a whole presentation where we're just putting out a lot of information. Right. Um, so maybe, a, you know, a short intro before each of the breakouts and or um, fact sheets that can be distributed. Yeah. Uh, you know, four different ones for each of the top, or however many we have, different topics, but somehow to integrate the two so that, you know, both are happening. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. I like the idea of back sheets. I think yeah. that's, yeah. that's a smart way to keep some guardrails on the conversations. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. And also it, um, it helps the conversation um, Again, from a shared starting point, right? Like you know, if everybody has the same fact sheet, everybody has the same information. You know, this Good is point. where you can start. And hopefully that's enough to kind of uh, temper any of those strong opinions that may be misinformed. Um, so thank you for the input on uh, engagement. Um, I see a, I still have a lot of work um, in terms of drafting survey questions and maybe formalizing the list of focus group, potential focus groups. Um, I've got a couple of actions uh, that I heard. I just want to make sure that um, those get noted. Mark, you're going to explore the idea of inserting yeah. into uh, a town, a -town mailing, mailing, whether it's Water and sewer, or it's property tax, or yeah, it's always something. <laughs> yes, debt and taxes and surveys. <laughs> so Mark will inquire if that's a possibility. Yeah. Get back to me. Um, Justin, would you be willing to share that draft document that you alluded to? Maybe a draft document about uh, the draft op-ed that was not submitted. Um, oh, I can share the. The data that I was, yeah, 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 at least the sub sort of reference. Yeah, the, the op ed itself was in response to another article, so okay, I think no. it's, it's not timely anymore, but I can share the content. Yeah. All right, that'd be, that'd be nice. I just would like to look at the taxes in particular. Yeah. Um, um, and I think I'll, uh, for our next one, since Strategy number three isn't urgent. Um, our next meeting, I'll come back with a little bit more detailed breakdown of options if we want to think about you know, what that could look like. Uh, recognizing that we want to make sure that there is an engage, uh, educational part before the edge and the engagement part. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so then looking at our next meeting time, um, go back to our agenda. Uh, we had agreed originally um, that we meet on July 4th. 
<laughs> right, exactly. On the water, right? <laughs> the sandbar. Um, originally, we were meeting uh, first and third Mondays. The first Monday is the first of July, correct? Um, I will not be in the state, so I won't be available to meet. Uh, it doesn't preclude you all from meeting, but um, just need to know if you want material to review uh, before then. If we were to go ahead with that date, is it something that Ken could stand in? Uh, no, I don't believe he's going to be around that week either. Okay. Right. Uh, the more I think about it, there might not be many planners okay. working that week. Okay. Well, it's a long month. Could we be second and fourth Monday instead? Would that work for people? There is a fifth Monday. That's what I meant. Third and fifth. To third and fifth. I mean, no, I meant second and fourth. But... Oh, so, okay. So, um, so those those vacations might some might be two weeks. Uh, I think that's what you were saying. Please. Actually, yes, the oh, eighth. Just... The eighth. I'm also out. Yeah, I I don't believe I'll be back in time to meet him, meet everybody. So I could do the four. third and fifth. I'd that's why you were saying third. Yeah, I do third, Sorry. fourth, and fifth of July. Mondays of third. So you do the fifteenth and the 29th. Depending on what your um, agenda was for the one on the 29th, you'd have one week turnaround to the first, obviously. I, uh, of August, you know, yeah. the first one in August, uh, I'll be away, but I mean, How about 15th and 22nd? I could probably be there. <laughs> no, you know, I was just saying, you know, we could do the Third and fifth, that's the 15th and the 29th. And then we can at that point see what August looks like if that needs to shift. Right. Uh, I wonder, I, um, is it worth looking at next week as well? We talked about the survey, the online survey questions. Those are going to have to go out sooner rather than later. So we could maybe you could draft those and we could review next week. So at the very least, that fall gets moving before the end of July. Yeah. The 24th. Okay, uh, yeah. next Monday. Yeah. Uh, I believe I'm available, so yeah. Um, and yes, if that's the case, then I think finalizing that plan survey and then having our draft survey ready. Um, so that we can at least have a link, you know, at least have it open and accessible, print copies at the senior center if we want to do a mailer and get another round of engagement and yeah. interest and include that. Yeah, so if you think you can turn around a survey. Yeah, I, I think your questions. And then it's a uh, short week, but yeah, yeah. you would look okay. into the, the water bill insert and we can report back on that next week. Mm. Right. Because that's, I imagine we have to get that going. If right. The next one's coming out in right. August. Uh, early August. Quick. And if we tweak anything on on that next week, we could just tweak it right there, and so he wouldn't have to bring it back to us again. It right. would be ready to go into the mailers of there. Right. Yeah. Um, Kayla, do you think we could do that in terms of getting a quick agenda? I can have that to you first thing in the morning. We could get it posted. Yeah, well, send it to me tomorrow. We should be able to get it in in time. I know. Um, we're off on Wednesday, so I'm still the talents as well. So, yeah, we'll just try to make sure that. Sorry, I can't hear you. Well, this Wednesday June. is Juneteenth. Yeah. Oh, June. let's see. That's a holiday. If I but... okay, so we would need to get it posted by end of day Thursday. So I could talk to the assistant clerk tomorrow to see if she can post it tomorrow or Thursday morning. I'll I'll have an agenda to you uh, first thing. Okay, sounds good. Uh, okay. And then we could plan on the July fifteenth. Fifteenth, yes. Fantastic. So, um, I will send out the appendix, which has those model bylaws for folks to review. Um, for the zoning map, 
Um, and then next week we'll have that final document, the final version of the land use survey and our draft okay. survey questions. To, um, to go over. Next Monday, do you think that's a one hour? I mean, I'm just trying to let people know. Yeah, I'm going to try to keep that. To, yeah, absolutely. So that would be, no, I mean, I, have, I, you know, if it takes 90 minutes, it's important work, yeah, you know. Yeah. But you think that, you know, since we've already hammered a lot of this out, I would, I would think an hour. So we could say to five to six, and then whatever you have lined up for the 15th, we can decide then if that's going to be a 90 minute meeting there. Yeah. That yeah. sounds good. Do we want to leave some surveys at like the transfer station? That's always great. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea, yeah. Andrew. Yeah. Actually, yeah. That's a, a QR code and at least a, a few hand, yeah. hard copies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's typically the best place. Council on Aging and transfer station. That's where you get most people. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, that's all I've got for tonight. Is that the end of our agenda? That's uh, discussion on next committee is the meeting is the last one. Right. I had one housekeeping item yep. um, that I got for my diversity committee, but I didn't get one for this, but I think it should, is they, uh, with the new, what we call it, fiscal year, the new town year, mm -hmm. um, we have to do reappointment of all committees. So there's a form that I can email to all of you as though you're asking to be appointed to this committee committee but it just goes in the record okay and then i and then there's a second form but i don't i sent both forms to my diversity committee but the other one is just for me to list everyone and what their position is on the committee so i'll just send you that one and there's a there's i think there's one little three line section where it's to ask you you know how do you think you're qualified for this you know whether you, you can go into your qualifications and your interests. I mean, I'm, we're not going to say, no, you're not on the committee. <laughs> you can just yeah. elaborate your passions. So, that's great. All right. Thank you. I'll try and send that out tonight. Because right. I think they need that by the 23rd. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In that case, uh, motion to adjourn. I would so entertain. We have a second? Second. Second. Uh, roll call. Justin Pellin, yes. Yes. Mark Dunn, yes. Amber Levinson, yes. Andrew Gnatic, yes. All right. We have concluded another meeting. Thank you, everyone.